I appreciate all of you coming today. This is the first of three uh, seminars uh, as part of the UNL Big Ideas uh, seminar series. And our particular topic is uh, uh, technology uh, for use in um, identifying or recognizing plants. Now, we've, we've got some variation in that because uh, there's obviously different things that are related to that. Um, but over the next uh, three weeks or so, uh, we're going to hear from uh, three different indiv individuals who are going to talk about uh, kind of the latest in what they're doing as far as uh, identifying plants, uh, the use of robotics uh, in uh, managing plants. Um, and uh, today, uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Simon Blackmore. Uh, he is with Harper Adams University. And Simon has traveled all the way from uh, UK to be with us here today. And I really appreciate him doing that. Um, uh, Dr. Blackmore is the head of the engineering department at Harper Adams University. Uh, before that, he's uh, spent some time uh, in his own endeavors looking at robotics and how that applies to agricultural systems. Uh, he travels the world, uh, has been to China, uh, different countries, talking about this subject. Uh, probably some of you uh, in this room or maybe even online uh, uh, have heard of him or have seen some of the things that he's done. Um, but I think you're really going to be interested in what he has to talk about today. And I would encourage you to stick around at the end. We will have time for a Q&A. Uh, and those of you who are online, I don't think that you can ask questions live, but you're welcome to uh, send emails later to uh, follow up. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Blackmore to uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about this topic. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Steve, for the invitation, and thank you very much indeed for the uh, invitation to actually come here and uh, join with you in this uh, very interesting uh, set of seminars. <coughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, as uh, Steve says, um, I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, uh, robotic agriculture. Um, I've been working in uh, precision farming for the last uh, 20 years or so and as an agricultural engineer I'm always intrigued by what technology can offer us and although the different technologies may well have different forms we are still trying to achieve the same goal and that is how do we make production agriculture more efficient there are lots of different drivers and opportunities with the technologies the um, legislation, the economic drivers and so on, but that's the, that's the goal. And so today I'm going to talk about um, uh, robotic agriculture and as a research professor it's my job to look into the future. It's uh, important to be able to see what opportunities we've got and what technologies that are being developed perhaps outside of agriculture that we can bring in and perhaps even that some of those technologies that we need to um, develop ourselves. So I'm from uh, Harper Adams University which is uh, here in, uh, in England in a county called Shropshire. It's uh, right out in the backwoods. Uh, it's one of the least population density uh, areas of, uh, of England but it's a lovely place to, uh, to work. Um, founded in 1901 by Thomas Harper Adams University College of the Year for a number of years. We cover crops, animals, food, land and engineering with about two and a half thousand students. So we're a small university but we specialize in the agriculture and land area. We've got a good reputation. We're first in the UK for graduate employment so all our students get jobs within well 96 percent of our students get jobs within six months. Uh, third in the UK for teaching excellence, just behind the OU Cambridge and then ourselves. This is always of interest to my wife because she works for the Open University so she says she's, uh, she's beating us on that one. And um, fifth in the UK for student satisfaction. So uh, the engineering department, we offer two uh, degrees, unique degrees. 
that are unique in the UK. Uh, my department is the only department of agriculture engineering in the whole of the UK. All of the others have been shut down over, over many years ago. But we're reversing the trend. We're getting record numbers of students. We're getting record numbers of interest and uh, uh, funding and so on. But we offer two degrees, agriculture engineering <coughs> and off-road vehicle design. And that's quite an interesting combination because a lot of the things that we teach in agricultural engineering are pertinent to off-road vehicles. And so we don't teach agriculture in that degree, but we do then uh, look at the vehicles themselves in more depth. And we offer a whole range from foundation degrees right the way through to PhD. I've got about uh, 30 staff and 300 students with a full workshop, um, an indoor soil hall where we can do um, experiments uh, without worrying about the vagaries of the weather, lots of tractors. And we're going to be starting a new master's in uh, 2013 in precision farming and another one in um, applied engineering. Developing links with China and Brazil and funding from uh, different companies. So this uh, um, has resulted in uh, setting up the National Centre for Precision Farming last year and we got an announcement from the, uh, our Prime Minister that uh, they'd actually then awarded us um, one and a half million pounds from the Government Catalyst Fund and we raised one and a half million for a new building. So we're going to have a nice new agriculture engineering building that's uh, going to have all sorts of uh, hopefully innovative technologies inside it including a full-sized uh, tractor simulation laboratory. So the centre is uh, uh, an inclusive, non-competitive uh, networking hub used for passing on information and bringing people together. It was quite interesting listening to um, your colleagues this morning at the uh, uh, all hands discussion about uh, the work that you're doing with your own uh, innovation campus and in fact I was, I was joking with um, Steve that uh, the, uh, the topics that we heard this morning could have been replayed at my university and it would have been exactly the same so <laughs> we have a lot of shared experiences there. But nevertheless the outcome of doing this is to help farmers meet today's political, economic and environmental needs by using smarter systems and I think this is the this is the key part to all of the work that we're doing to develop uh, systems, techniques, uh, processes and machines that are smarter than the previous versions. And then we're going to deal with a number of different services. So today's topic is talking about robots, so there's a nice lot of robots all brought together. Um, before I started at Harper Adams two years ago, I was project manager of the European Future Farm project and we brought robots together from all over Europe um, at the field robot event where we could then evaluate them, try them out, see how good they were and quite often see how unreliable they were. Uh, this is actually an issue that we do really need to get serious about and find ways of making these machines uh, more uh, reliable and robust than perhaps where they have been in the past. So if we're going to look forward, one of the things I think always to do is to take a little look backwards and look at sort of current trends. And we've seen machines getting bigger all the time. If you talk to any of the tractor manufacturers and ask them about what their next model is going to be, it's going to be something that's bigger than was there previously. Can that continue? In 10 years time, in 20 years time, is this uh, linear development of machine size going to continue? Are we going to get um, 2,000 horsepower tractor? Are we going to get things that are six times larger than they are at the moment? I think intuitively I would say no. There's got to be a limit to what we can do. And what we're actually finding is that these uh, big machines um, are viable in certain conditions. And even in this funny little cartoon down here of showing how tractors are uh, developing and getting bigger over the years, if you're prairie farming, then yes, you can stand a 900 horsepower tractor, 1,000 horsepower tractor, because you're effectively doing industrial farming. You're just getting out there trying to cover the acres as quickly as you possibly can. But I think 
there is some alternatives. And although we've got advantages with the current system, very effective, reduced labour costs per hectare, high work rates, good for large farms and fields, which is effectively taking advantage of the economies of scale. It's a classic case that's being carried out in industry. Economies of scale, you can make it bigger. If you're going to pay somebody an hour to sit on a tractor, if they can do 20 acres rather than 10 acres, that makes sense. But there are disadvantages as well. Operators are expensive. The, cost of the capital cost of these machines is a lot of money. Uh, reduced flexibility, non-scalable. What about the possibility of subsoil compaction? And I'll come back to compaction in a few more times. If we start compacting the subsoil so that the plants cannot grow, we do not have enough energy in any machine to be able to rip out subsoil compaction. It is so deep and so, so much energy is needed. And we can also start thinking about trafficability. Now, again, if we now look a little bit in terms of managing these situations, um, we can consider the units of, uh, um, the ma what are the management units? So quite often, um, farm managers will perhaps do the same operation across the whole farm or may do the same operation across one field, which is the traditional way of doing things. We've seen with precision farming that it makes sense to divide the field up into sub-areas and be able then to treat different areas with different treatments and we get the variable uh, dose rate, patch application and so on. But if we continue that, what is the smallest area of treatment? What's the smallest unit of treatment that we can deal with? And I would suggest the smallest unit of treatment we can deal with is actually the individual plant. Now we don't normally think of things at that level because if we had a manned tractor or if you and I um, were doing this it would be highly repetitive and would be too difficult to deal with but I'm going to show you a number of uh, robots that can actually deal with this plant level um, husbandry, this individual um, plant uh, care system. Now to be able to do this I think we need to take on or to develop a new generation of machinery based on plant needs. The more that I've been looking at um, how we are currently dealing with um, mechanization, I see that the limitation is actually to do with the machines themselves. It is actually the machine that is causing the problem in the first place. But if we can, all right, I can almost bring it around the other way. Let's, let me ask a question. Can we then uh, come up with a system that doesn't have the limitations that we've got at the moment, but can still carry out all of the agronomic requirements needed by a mechanization system? And my answer to that is yes, that we can. But if we come up with this new generation of machinery based on plant needs, we can do operations that we cannot do now or find too expensive or time consuming. We need lower energy. I will come back to intelligently targeted inputs in a moment small area or plant scale operations, low compaction, modular and scalable, cost effective fleet management. There's a lot of high technology, new ways of managing these machines when we develop it as a system. Now if we do develop it as a system, I like to think that I am a, a systems thinker and one of the aspects of systems thinking is to understand the multiple perspectives of a system. And so here I'm going to show you um, some of the perspectives that we've taken into account when trying to design the system. So we need to think about safety, energy, economics, environment, management, mechanization, technology, and society. Now it's a big ask to come up with a a design that can deal with all of that but of course it gets complex very quickly then because then we end up with a whole range of other issues coming into this. But again if we are going to try and design a system to go inside this box in the middle here 
then if we want that to be successful, it has to meet most of those uh, requirements. So we have to understand the system well enough to be able to come up with one that is going to solve more problems than it's going to cause. So if we do uh, come up with this system, what are the implications? Well, we then it should be good for the environment to be able to come up with minimal uh, energy inputs. Um, I've had discussions the last couple of days with Steve where what we're really trying to do with these things is to actually what is the minimum amount that you need to change the environment. If we've got the natural environment out there and we are converting it to do something useful for us, grow our crops and grow our food, what's the minimum energy that is needed to be able to adjust the natural environment? And that's why I keep coming back to energy because I, we could have done it through economics but that is quite uh, can at times be quite vague and, and difficult to understand, but we can actually, as engineers, understand this whole process through looking at the energy flows. It's good for the environment, allows controlled biodiversity. Um, at the moment we consider any other plant growing inside the crop as a weed and we see that as competitive and it shouldn't be there, so we need to dig it out. That's not necessarily the case. We can have plants growing in the field that can at times be complementary to the crop. And if it is not competitive, then why don't we leave it there? It's good for wildlife, it's good for the, the birds and the bees and all the rest of it. So the understanding of what is a weed and what isn't a weed is, is very useful. Economics, we can talk about uh, labour costs. Um, one of the most expensive things on a tractor is the person sitting there. Does that person need to be there? I'm not saying we're going to replace all tractors, I don't think we will, and we're not re replacing farmers. We will, farmers will always be farmers, but what we are developing here is a new set of tools for farmers to use. Economics incremental investment, these smaller machines, we can then uh, have scalability if you want to up the work rate, you don't have to sell that tractor and buy one double the size, you can have two, three, four, six of these small machines, depending on exactly what it is that you're trying to do. The concept of redundancy, if you've got one big tractor at the moment and that breaks down, the whole thing stops. If you've got half a dozen robots running around, maybe you've got a spare one in the, uh, in the garage, you bring it out, start it up and off you go again. It's giving a lot more control to what is actually going on. Social, public perception of agriculture improved, we see a lot of movies about robots and uh, the public acceptance is that if we've got a cute little thing that's running around here doing something useful for us, that's acceptable. We, uh, the public like that. And to be able to have um, these machines helping us in agriculture, I think, is already accepted in, uh, in the public. I know I'm talking to an American uh, audience here and I apologise. You like big things. You like your tractors to be like that. Well, um, at the moment I like my tractor to be like that. But that is only whilst we work out what safe and reliable is. After we've spent time understanding what um, safe and reliability issues are, we can scale them up. But in the first generation of robots I think they're going to be smaller. And so um, that overcomes the issues of liability. If, if it's a small vehicle and it's only running at a couple of miles an hour and it bangs into your leg and you get a bruise, that's not a problem. If it bangs into your car and you've got a dented fender, you get your insurance on it. It's not life-threatening. If we talk about the, the, the big conventional tractors, then uh, that's a different issue altogether. So uh, it's different stages of development. And we've got a lot of opportunities to be able to use existing research sensors, a lot of PhDs around the world are developing interesting new systems and sensors that don't get outside of the laboratory. Uh, if it takes a few minutes, we're interested in understanding weeds, recognition of weeds. Again, I'll come back to that. If it takes five minutes to analyse a picture, well, hopefully in a few years' time the computing power will up so it won't take long. But we could implement some of these systems now if they were not on man tractors. If a man has to sit there waiting for it to take a picture and then move 
a, a yard and sit there and wait to take another picture. That doesn't make any sense. But if it's a robot, why not? It can sit there for 24 hours a day taking <coughs> these pictures. So I don't see any reason why we take advantage of these opportunities now. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit about um, energy. If we take at the farm, where does all of the energy come from? All comes from the sun originally, and it comes then through light, air, and rain onto the farm. But that energy has been stored up over the years in terms of fossil fuels, and we then take uh, these uh, fossil fuels and turn them into herbicides, pesticides, fertilizer, and so on, that all then come onto the farm. We also then uh, take this energy and uh, turn it into machinery and also turn it into fuel to run that machinery. And the outcome then is the food. Here comes the but. But we also have produced a lot of biomass that we don't use. We have lots of waste. We have a lot of off-farm pollution. And it is amazing if you actually start to think about how we apply energy onto our farms uh, in the past and how we still do it now, it is, it is almost random. We take energy in terms of chemicals and we throw it. We throw fertilizer out onto, the, out onto the field. We have sprayers that go up and down and cover the whole area. And it's because we don't know what's going on enough with these dumb machines. We have to smarten them up. But um, where we are then talking about these energy flows coming through here, we can then consider, um, as mo m most uh, uh, countries are, the energy crops and the bioenergy and the biofuels. And in fact, what we have here is a very nice opportunity for a closed loop system. <coughs> and we thought, hey, this is a real good idea. If we then can grow the crops on the farm to fuel the tractors, um, this is a really new radical idea. And then somebody said, isn't that what they used to do with horses? <laughs> oh, yes. It's exactly the same thing. The horse was the motive uh, unit of power. You'd set, grass, uh, set land aside, feed the horse, get the power out of the horse. And we're just uh, coming back to these um, uh, old systems, but in, in, uh, with a modern twist. And again, that happens a few times through my presentation. But um, if this is then the current system, what we then want to do is to minimize the energy, these blue arrows here, to be able to minimize these ones down here. So what we need to do here then is to consider this concept of intelligent placement of energy. If we've then got the sensors to be able to understand what's there and only put on the minimum of what's actually needed, we can then perhaps reduce um, these ones down here and increase this whole concept of efficiency within the system. So robotic agriculture then leads on to the concept of multiple small intelligent machines, in some cases replacing large man tractors, multiple machines to increase work rates, longer working hours, safe and reliable, easy to manage. New concept here, robot shepherd. What do I mean by that? Shepherd, person who looks after a flock of sheep. What about the person who then will look after a, a flock of robots? So it's not necessary that the person was sitting on the tractor now, but maybe there, uh, if we can sort of play our minds through a concept, the, the guy turns up at the field with his uh, a white van and a trailer on the back, and he lets down the ramps and offloads half a dozen robots and presses the green button and they scoot off doing things and then uh, he's sitting there drinking his coffee while they're all working out in the field and then one of them is saying I've got a flat tire another one a bit later on saying I need to be refueled then you've got the the concept of a robot shepherd and it may be that um, uh, that person doesn't need to be within the field maybe it is the farm manager themselves that then will be checking on the phone to make sure that uh, um, uh, robot number three is OK and robot number six is fine and suddenly gets a, a message from robot number 10 saying, um, I need help. These things are always in uh, communication. And so there's some new concepts coming up in how we then would interact with these smarter machines. So. Um, 
What are the system requirements then? They need to be lightweight, able to work in soft soil, small and autonomous, computational autonomy, and energetic autonomy. Um, it's an interesting concept. Um, at the Bristol Robotics Laboratory, uh, where I have one of my visiting chairs in the UK, uh, a student actually developed a slug eating robot. This machine could um, identify, using machine vision, could identify slugs in a crop, could pick the slug up and, would you believe, put it into a biodigester, where the biodigester had a uh, biological fuel cell in it, which then powered the robot. And they were aiming then for energetic autonomy. It didn't work. We couldn't get energetic <laughs> autonomy. But he proved that, well, it was only sort of about 1% efficient. So <laughs> it, uh, it ran out of uh, battery pretty quick. But um, nevertheless, there's some other interesting ideas. Can these things, could these things take a bite out of a sugar beet to be able to get enough sugar to be able to keep it going after a period of time? Solar panels and wind wouldn't work. There's not enough energy in those. But again, looking at renewables to be able to keep them going. The concept of uh, independence and dependence, I'll come up with later on. As engineers, we don't like redundancy. When we design things, we try to make sure there is no redundancy. But if we want safety in these machines and the ability to have self-awareness, then we actually have to build redundancy in. So if one section goes down, there is another section there that knows that that first section has gone down and then maybe can take remedial action. That's what we then call graceful degradation. Uh, we've all been frustrated where you turn the PC on and you've just got a blank screen or a machine and it doesn't put the key in the lock, nothing happens. We don't want that to happen. We want, the, if this is a smart machine, it should then tell you why it is not working. It should be able to communicate with you somehow and to be able to work at night. So there's a whole range of different system requirements here. The machine behaviours themselves uh, is then, or the, 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 the intellectual challenge that I've had trying to develop these machines is how do we embed enough intelligence within them to get them to do what we want them to do? And the breakthrough for me came through the concept of behaviours and a behaviour is a concerted set of simple actions to achieve one particular outcome. And we can think about some of these behaviours in terms of navigation, go from A to B, route following, stay on the line as you're going down a, a crop row, refueling, refilling, obs uh, explore, obstacle mapping, so on. These are all separate behaviours and it's a process of uh, what we call subsumption where you can have more primitive behaviours underneath. But we are developing these finite state diagrams to be able then to come up with what we can consider would be the um, specific behaviours and the triggers uh, or the routes that can go between behaviours so that you cannot go from this behaviour to this behaviour without going through this behaviour. Um, and what do we mean by intelligence? Well, I, I try not to use intelligence to the word intelligence too much because it is, um, it is a human trait. Uh, I think intelligence should be reserved for people. Um, emotional intelligence, we know the difference between good and bad. We make these judgments. A machine doesn't have these abilities. But nevertheless, we can still make a machine that appears to be intelligent. If, uh, if we had a robot in the room here that was sweeping the floor and it does it in a sensible way that we say, yes, that's reasonable, then that's good enough. That's, we're not asking this robot to go and play the piano or paint a picture, which is what we would then say with intelligence, to be able to deal with unknown situations. But if it can do what we are asking it to do, then that's good enough. And there is a, a simple test, the Turing test, if it's indistinguishable from human behaviour. So if the robots do what a person would do, then, as I say, that's probably good enough. So the autonomous behaviour is divided into two different parts. That which is uh, purely deterministic, 
And what I mean by that is that we can determine it beforehand where we use knowledge and can be optimized. So if we've got a, a field here, there's basically a triangular shaped field and we know the turning circle of the vehicle and we know the working width of the vehicle, we can then come up with an optimal plan so there's no skip, no overlap and to be able then to just do exactly what we want very simply and very efficiently. But the other type of behavior is a, uh, a reactive task, which is then uh, how do you deal with unknown objects or obstacles. So if we've got the machine out in the field and it comes across something it doesn't know about, what do we want to do? Well, ultimately, as you or I would do, if I want to go from here to here, I would recognize that there is an obstacle in front of me, but I would recognize that as a chair. Now, we find that process very easy. We recognize things all the time. But in the computational side of things, that's actually a very difficult thing to do, um, to be able to recognize objects. But we don't need to recognize every object that we might come across. What we need to do is to recognize the particular class of the problem. And in this case, uh, if I stand here and wait for a few seconds and see that the chair is not going to move, then I know that is a static object and I can then go around it. If I'm standing here watching it and it does move, then I'll wait long enough and perhaps it'll move out the way and then I can continue. So this is the concept of the reactive tasks and what we then need, of course, is a hybrid system that can deal with or, or utilize both of these two techniques. So, um, many tractors at the moment are uh, using uh, auto steer. Um, we've seen the advantage of uh, uh, straight line assist and operator assist technologies. The next uh, step forward is in then going to be in full route planning. And the next stage beyond that is going to go into controlled traffic farming. So, uh, to me, uh, the next big no-brainer in agriculture is going to be controlled traffic farming. And I'll give you some reasons for that in a moment. But let's come back to route planning. So if we've got an odd-shaped field here, um, at the moment perhaps an operator would normally look for the longest straight line edge and then work up and down and work the whole way across. But that may not necessarily be the most efficient way of doing it. There are different options we've got. We can have uh, skip rows. Um, we can then uh, um, have simple turns. And we can use, as we do at the moment, uh, craft knowledge. And um, this all then is part of the robot management information system that's being developed at different universities around the world, which then is a, um, a way in which we can come up with the tools that are then needed to be able to manage these machines in uh, hopefully uh, an efficient way and of course to be able to take the workload off from the farmer. What we've seen with precision farming is that um, uh, as scientists and engineers and researchers we made agriculture too complex for many farmers. Um, as scientists when we could do yield mapping and soil mapping and uh, um, all these other nice things, we were fascinated by it. How did that help the farmers? It didn't. It made it more complicated. If they've got all of these, they've got a, it's a data overload situation. How does a farmer make money out of a soil map? Well, the clever ones will be able to say how that can be done. But we have to, as we are designing these systems, we have to introduce a level of maturity in them that makes it simpler uh, to use. Here is uh, an example of some route planning software. So one of the deliverables from the Future Farm project can be seen at uh, web-farming.com. And uh, uh, it uses uh, Google Earth as a, as a plugin. And uh, you can then set up a, a system. Um, and uh, you can click around the edge of your field. You can tell uh, what tractor you've got, what the working width is, what the turning uh, radius is. And it will then uh, come up with, hopefully, what will be an optimal route for you to then follow. Quite often, these are <coughs> intuitive. We can see, yes, that makes sense. But it, in fact, sometimes it 
can pick up <coughs> more optimal um, routes that uh, are not so intuitive. So uh, we're doing some experiments at the moment, uh, uh, taking, the, um, uh, taking these route plans and putting them into the uh, auto steer systems within the tractor to see if we can get the full um, route plan uh, uh, implemented here. That's a good site. What can you learn or what do you understand from uh, that situation? Now, I know you've just gone through a year of drought. I'm terribly sorry, I apologize, but Britain's had all of your rain. We've just gone through the wettest year on record. So all your rain's moved over to us. So we're gonna try and send it back. In fact, I was accused this morning of bringing the weather with me because it was all misty and foggy and, and rainy and horrible. So. I'll try and come back a bit more often and <laughs> keep my suitcases full and uh, bring some fog back for you. But uh, this is the situation that we are dealing with. And it is interesting because um, it made me realize that current tractors cannot enter the fields when the soil is wet. And horsepower doesn't help when weight is the problem. Weight is the problem. These big tractors Okay, you, you might have the biggest, best tractor in the world, but if the soil's like this and you can't go out there, and it started to make me actually think about, okay, another pro I like big tractors, don't get me wrong, but they have got problems. And if um, the tractor can't go out at that time, what's happening is that there is a reduced window when this big tractor can be used. And because that window is reduced, you need a big tractor to have the high work rates. So there's a, a cycle coming in here. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And as the tractor gets bigger, the window gets smaller, and therefore you need the higher work rates. And so we're going into this funneling down situation where um, you can't go any further. And we've got to find an alternative way of doing it. And I think, as agriculture engineers, we should be smart enough to make a machine that can go out and put seed into the ground. How, that's, how we're going to do it, I don't know. Tracks, wheels, balloon tires, maybe. Uh, UAVs, maybe. If I've got a robot that is the size <coughs> of a shoebox that could go out there and do that, that's not going to compact the soil. That could run around on top there, not cause a problem, not sink. If a tractor is that big, it is going to sink. But how big these machines ought to be, I don't know, we still need to work that out. So can we design a tractor that can run on soil? So I think the answer should be yes. Another factor to consider, here we can see sugar beet growing in the field and here we can see a, a hard pan underneath the cultivation layer here. I was talking about the compaction of subsoil. Large tractors cause significant soil compaction that results up to 90% of the energy being used in cultivation is there to repair the damage caused by the machinery in the first place. Why do we cultivate? We cultivate to break up the soil. Fine, we've always done that. Why, do we, why is the soil more compact? Um, the tractors have squashed it down. Um, why? why if, can we come up with systems that don't cause the problem in the first place? And so, um, as we know, every, every kilonewton that you need in that direction, you need another kilonewton in that direction to be able to give you the traction. So that's why we got big heavy tractors, to be able to drag heavy bits of metal through the soil. If we stop dragging heavy bits of metal through the soil, we don't need the vertical load, we don't cause the compaction. Low ground pressure tires, controlled traffic farming, route planning. Can we develop a system that does what we want without composing compaction problems, ultralight machines, we're dealing with concepts of micro tillage, zero draft force. There's a whole range of new opportunities. If we just take the opportunity to take a, a sideways step, don't just say, well, this is where we've come from and this is where we're going to go. We've got to do some lateral thinking. We've got to think about things in, in different ways. So time, it's pretty picture time. There we are. Ta-da! No, this is, uh, I, I did some work with uh, Massey Ferguson a couple of years ago where they helped me to visualize some of the designs. So all the sort of crazy designs, 
or can go into some of the uh, some of these uh, some of these drawings. And I'm not saying they're even going to look like this. These are a discussion document where we can then I can <coughs> help you visualise some of the things that um, I've got in my mind. And uh, as we know, a, a picture paints a, uh, is better than a thousand words. So. The ability to be able to come up with uh, uh, some graphics that will then talk about um, uh, minimum tillage or zero micro tillage, uh, getting the right weight in the tractor, getting uh, so that it doesn't compact the soil, being able to do all of these different operations may result in machines that uh, uh, would be radically different. Which then really brings us on to this concept of uh, phytotechnology. And we can consider things like uh, the three stages, establishment of the crop, crop care, and um, harvesting. And in terms of uh, when we're talking about these things, we do come up with some new terminology. So I'll run through some quickly with you. The concept of a seed map is where we then know the position of every seed that goes into the ground. We've then got the concept of a crop map when we then get emergence. So in some places it won't... Uh, we don't get emergence, but in other places we do, and we can then uh, know where each one of these plants are. We can come up, or we come up with the, uh, uh, when we're discussing these things in terms of a weed map, which either can be in terms of areas or the location of individual plants. We talk of the intero area, that space between the rows of the crop, the intra row area the space inside the row between each individual plant and the close to crop area which then needs uh, special attention especially when we're trying to get some type of machine to interact with the uh, with the growing plant so if we think about uh, seeding and the issues of putting seed into the ground uh, most seed only guarantees 80 percent germination and so what do we do at the moment? We over-apply seeds to be able to uh, get uh, what we want. And in fact, for many crops, or some crops, particularly like sugar beet, we put a lot more seed into the ground and actually have designed machines to go and kill all these viable plants because they then there's too many of them. Now that, to me, is a waste. Can we come up with systems, a uh, seeding system that puts seed into the ground directly where we need it and try and make sure that we get uh, a much higher success rate. The seeders produce void areas because the seeders themselves uh, get, uh, get it wrong, don't do it always right. We have a problem of uh, intra-row competition between plants. You put the plants too close together, this one competes with this one. And so they don't grow as well as they should. They all need equal access to land, uh, water, air and other resources. Can we control seed depth for moisture? Again, uh, uh, you've got a, 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 a group here dealing with uh, drought and how to deal with droughts. Well, could we have a machine that could judge the depth of where the moisture... It might be a bit deep to have to go down if, you're dealing, if you are in the middle of a bad drought, but the ability to be able to put it in deeper according to the moisture content and not so deep if the moisture content is right. Can we orient seeds to reduce inter-row uh, competition? And um, I think that we can. So here we have a machine that was developed, uh, that we developed a number of years back in, uh, in Denmark. Um, here's a high precision seeder with a RTK GPS on the top here and some electronics down here. And down the bottom here then we've got a, uh, a light beam and um, uh, when the seed drops through, breaks the light beam, we can record the position um, of uh, where that seed was dropped. And we, uh, to test it then, we took a quadrat out, georectified the, or uh, worked out the position of the camera, took a picture of it, georectified the image, and overlaid the data. And what we can see here <coughs> is, uh, it's, it's not a very good picture, but uh, we can see the position of where the machine thought that it dropped the seed and we can see where the uh, emergent seeds came out. Uh, the blue line is, uh, uh, blue crosses is the uh, data from the RTK GPS. And we found that um, um, we would know where the uh, plants were to within two centimeters. So it is actually a, a case of uh, 
the same sort of level of accuracy as we get from the GPS itself. Um, what's the, why do we get the error? Well, of course, it could be anything. One of the things can we, could be in terms of we get different aggregate sizes in there and then the seedling can come around and come out at a different point. Which leads us on to the concept of ultra-high accuracy seeding. So um, the placement of seed in a predefined pattern, we can have perhaps synchronized planting. I mean, it is a question. OK, it's a genuine question to me. Let, let, let's see if you can come up with an answer. Why do we grow crops in rows? See, nobody's ever thought about that one. Why do we grow crops in rows? you win the prize. It comes back down to the machine. If you think about uh, day one of agriculture, where this chap in his bear skins, he found a bent stick and he dragged it through the soil and he put some seeds into the ground. That's the simplest type of mechanization. Is that the optimal way of treating those seeds? No, it's not. That's making agriculture simpler for the machine. Can we come up with a system that can put seeds in their own equal space? Yes, we can. We can consider equal space per plant. But those of you that are in the audience, you can see that immediately we are getting lines, but in a different direction now. So then we came up with a concept of grid seeding. Why don't we just put them all on a grid? And we thought, hey, this is great. This is another new idea. And I had a tour around your um, museum this morning um, and I actually saw a machine that somebody had talked to me years ago they said that's not a new idea the horses used to do that and uh, they used to have a lay a rope in the ground and put knots in the rope and it would then drop the seed every time it came to a knot and come around the other way and do the same coming back and we actually saw a machine in your mu museum that did exactly that but of course now we need $15,000 worth of GPS equipment and computer controllers and all of these other things to do exactly the same thing in terms of the grid seeding. But I could see there are some very good opportunities uh, with this grid seeding. So we've got the concept of synchronized planting because then uh, we can do it in, uh, uh, put the whole field down into a grid which then would allow us to be able to do orthogonal uh, inter-row um, uh, weeding. And so if we've then got the plants on a regular grid, we've then got the weeds growing randomly, and what we can then perhaps do is very simply, so there's no robot on this tractor, it's just a very simple inter-row weeding system, but because it's on the grid, we can then take out a significant number of those weeds. Crop scouting is a big issue, and again, uh, listening to the talk this morning about phenotyping, having your own uh, automated uh, phenotyping system um, undercover, um, we've been involved in the same discussions in the UK. Uh, a lot of money over the last 10, 15 years has gone into being able to manipulate all the uh, genes in, in these plants, understanding the expression of those genes is a different thing. But the discussion we're having at the moment is that it's not worth doing the phenotyping in glass houses because the plants express the genes in different ways outside compared to inside. So what we're talking about now is phenotyping robots, machines that can go into the field to do that same level of measurement but in the field rather than doing it inside the uh, glass house. And in fact, at the moment, for um, many uh, crop trials, the limitation is the cost of the people. If you want to do a, a trial, you've got to get lots of samples to make it statistically sound. Why don't you take thousands of uh, plots? Because it's too expensive to do the sampling. The land's available, the seeds are there, so on and so forth but it's the people that are the limiting factor in this case. And so it's laborious, difficult to find qualified staff, data must be transcribed, low levels of repeatability, if it rains everybody goes home, it's expensive. So these trials are limited by expensive data capture. It's the people in the loop that's causing the problem. Can we come up with a system to phenotype plants automatically? And uh, that's one of our current, uh, current projects. 
So I know that uh, Li Tang is going to be with you, in, so I hope I'm not going to steal his thunder. These are his videos here. But um, he, he worked with me in Denmark. We worked together in, in Denmark, so this is why I'm laying claim to some of his work. Um, we had a, um, a little crop scouting robot out here with a different uh, uh, number of sensing systems on here. And what uh, Lee did was to um, stitch some uh, 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 a video together to create one long bitmap that allowed him to develop um, machine recognition um, to know where these plants are. And if, if we don't know the position of them to begin with, we, uh, through the seed uh, mapping system, we can do it at the seedling stage so we can identify each individual plant. And that's not a lot of technology that's needed. It's a webcam and a PC to be able to do that. It's not, not necessarily expensive. Now the interesting thing is, and it'll come up in a minute, that we can not only identify the plants, but we can also identify the growing points. And we'll use that information in a minute. So here's the first generation of the uh, Crop Scout. Um, again, this one was developed in, uh, in Denmark. It's no more than a desk with a, with a wheel on each corner. Um, but what it does is very useful um, because it is an instrument carrier, so we can mount on it expensive equipment, uh, it can move around, it can take lots of different uh, samples. Um, in its base form, which is this, it just follows a particular, uh, particular route. Um, and uh, if anything gets in the way, it just stops and calls for help. So safety is not a problem. Um, two master students designed and built and made the whole thing, so it's not such a difficult problem. Aarhus University developed it, we put different sensors on it, but it was this part that stuck in my mind, it's that this, this simple robot could go out and survey 250 plots a day. So I don't know if any of you are into crop trials, but that, that's more than a person could be able to do. And this this table with a wheel on each corner can go out there and do that highly repeatable for us. The second generation uh, that was developed at the uh, Fackerschul in uh, Osnabrück with uh, Amazon was done by Arno Ruckelhausen and uh, we can see the uh, uh, machine here. This has got many more features on it. Um, it's all um, uh, hydraulic and lots and lots of computers. Um, it's a good technology platform. Um, I don't think it needs to be quite as complex as um, that we've got there, but that again is another uh, proof of concept, and that actually is a, a phenotyping robot. And you can see the light curtain underneath the bottom bottom here that then can take all the um, uh, bring the information in. So that's uh, that's uh, Bonnie Rob from uh, from Germany, and then this is the again one of my concept vehicles um, that I hope that we can build within the next few years. We've got some money now to do it, and. That then has got a number of different features on it, very narrow uh, wheels and tires to be able to go in between the crop. There's guards around the, the tires so that the crop doesn't damage the machine, the machine doesn't damage the crop, high ground clearance, all of these different things. So weed and crop mapping with machine vision, crop stress through ethylene detection, insect infestation through uh, volatile organic compound detection, uh, crop growth rates through crop height, crop nutrient status through multispectral response, crop quality and quantity estimation before harvest, autonomous phenotyping and 3D uh, canopy models. So this is the sensing platform. This is where you put your clever instruments on it and th that robot does no more than carry those clever instruments around. Here's the uh, Bonnie Rob uh, simulation using uh, LiDAR. So we've got the uh, sick laser on here. And by moving along here then, uh, we can then get 3D information about that uh, particular plant. And because we know the location of each plant, that can be recorded. And we can then actually see the development. Again, a useful concept or a useful bit of information from the phenotyping point of view. I've been um, going to uh, China for the last uh, 12 years. I have different uh, chairs at different universities there. And one of the projects that I was presented with last year from um, NACITA 
um, really made me change the way that I think about instrumentation. What we've got here is the ability to understand the context of the measurement that we take. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine, look, ahead, look over here, we've got a cloud of points and that cloud of points can be then turned into surfaces that can then come through into a complete crop model. But imagine if we've got that one point there and rather than using uh, LIDAR to take that measurement, we've got a hyperspectral response. So we've got one pixel with a hyperspectral response from it. What can we understand from that? Well, we know we're going to get variability, but the trouble is we don't know which part that data came from. We don't know the context. Was it from the leaf? Was it from the stem? We need another aspect of this work. We need to be able to recognize where it came from. And with this concept of canopy models giving us the whole context of what's actually going on will significantly, I think, move the understanding of crop development and the measurement of the crops, move it uh, significantly ahead. And so in terms of having this model, we've then got a leaf there and we know all of the different uh, um, uh, measurement parameters that we've taken about that leaf, what leaf it is, what part of the, the stem, where it occurred and all the rest of it, what is being embodied within a crop model. So crop to me, crop modeling is taking on a, um, a, a, a different aspect rather than just doing it plant by plant, we can do it actually over the whole um, shape of the plant. I talked before in terms of weather dependence and weather independence. If we consider what goes on at the moment, if uh, a farmer wants to go and spray the field, then <coughs> when spraying a driver, uh, you're not allowed obviously to spray when the wind is high. So if a man, machine go, a man goes out with the machine, the wind gets up, he says, OK, I'm going to call a halt on it today, I'm going to go home. What happens if the wind drops down in half an hour? He's already gone home. Oh, well, I'm not going to go out again, and maybe I'll go out tomorrow. If we've got the concept of a machine that can go out there with its own weather station and spray, and then when the, weather get, when the wind gets too high, it stops, it waits. When the wind drops down again, it moves on for half an hour. We've got the ability to work with the weather and opening up more of these windows. Can we machine, build a machine that can wait for the wind to die down and continue? And I think the answer is yes, if we can make it an autonomous machine. So again, there's some of the concepts that we've been playing with. Um, <coughs> here we've got the canisters on the side. Um, in fact, some of the chemical manufacturers are very keen to work with us on this. You would have thought that if we were going to cut all this down, um, that they would be against it, but they're actually not. Um, there may well be opportunities for new formulation, and certainly taking chemicals out of containers is seen as a bad thing now. You ought to be able to go down the shop and buy a sealed container. It'll have an RFID tag in it or a, or a QR code on the side of it. You come and you plug it into the machine. The machine knows exactly what the chemical is. It knows all the health and safety. It knows all the regulations. It will use it at the correct dose rates and at the end of the field when it's half full you can take it out and put it back in the store. No waste, no mixing, no problems that we've got um, uh, with our conventional machines at the moment. So it brings us on to then uh, weed recognition. Again this work was done at uh, Dias a number of years ago in Denmark. Uh, looking at um, ways in which you can then uh, recognize um, uh, different weeds. And the most powerful technique was to actually use active shape recognition. Now this was a technique that was used for facial recognition. As a human I can recognize all the individual faces in front of me. But what the machine does, it takes a standard template of a cartoon face and for every face that it then gets presented with it moves the eyes to the right distance apart, the characteristic about the nose and the mouth and everything else. And it is all of these different characteristics that can be used then to be able to recognize the different species of weeds. So here you can see the standard template being used. It is then morphed around the uh, weed itself and we can then use those different parameters to recognize 
uh, up to 26 different species of weeds. If we then uh, can um, understand what is happening with the weeds, then perhaps we've got the opportunity to be able then to spray them. You see there's no other weeds around here uh, because uh, we've done the mechanical weeding, but here then perhaps we've got the camera going across and a little spray boom uh, like a, an inkjet printer that can then only put the chemical onto the uh, leaf of the, of the weed. And so here is the uh, robot doing the work um, first uh, with the first micro sprayer down here. Uh, in fact, uh, this was uh, Dave Slaughter's um, micro spray boom. He lent it uh, uh, to us in Denmark and uh, uh, we then used it here to be able then to spray on those weeds. And so um, we could then be able to get, um, uh, save a, a huge amount of uh, uh, en um, chemical by only spraying where we needed to. But uh, there's no sound on this particular uh, video at the moment, but here is a, uh, one of the students at uh, Southern Denmark University who's got a, a pot plant here uh, with a, um, uh, a specimen then of a weed. Um, here you can see a, a light hood over here with uh, lighting around, omnidirectional lighting inside there, and it's got a camera on the top that's looking down. And then underneath there, then we've got the latest generation of the spray boom. So you've got seven nozzles of the micro sprayer across there. And uh, the idea, of course, is then just to uh, uh, recognize the uh, weed and put the chemical um, now only onto the leaf of the weed, not over the top of the weed, but only onto the leaf of the weed itself. So this, again, is a simulation. So the robot arm is simulating the camera going uh, along a crop row. We can do all this in, in real time. And that's just a normal laptop there. And if you look closely, on each leaf, you'll see a blue dot. You see the blue, blue dot there, blue dot there. How about coming up with a system that can save 99.99% of the herbicide? I mean, we're not talking of some save 5%, save 10%, save 15%. How about saving 99%? of the herbicide by coming up with a smart machine. And there's got to be opportunities to be able to commercialize something like that, I think. Mechanical weeding, <laughs> yuck. I wouldn't fancy doing that, but people are asked to do that and people are paid money to do that. Um, in the UK, um, the, uh, forg uh, forgive me for the units, but it's a thousand pounds an acre to do that. A thousand pounds an acre for mechanical weeding for organic. So there's, that's costing a lot of money at the moment. Can we come up with better systems? Well, you can come up with the um, um, cycloid weed hoe. Again, this concept was developed at uh, Osnabrück, and they lent us this uh, this head, and it does the inter row and the intra row leaving the um, close to crop area alone. And this is the autonomous tractor that I developed in Denmark with a side shift toolbar here. And here then we've got the um, cycloid weed hoe. And what it's doing is that it's withdrawing the leg every time that there is a plant there. So it's then stirring the soil, it's weeding the soil um, in the inter-row area and the intra-row area and then leaving the plant alone. It gets a bit close to some of the plants towards the end here and it moves them which is not a good thing but um, again we've got the, uh, the proof of concept there. Now what is the sensing system on that? Well it's no more than GPS. Uh, it's always the two centimetre. It's the better than one inch uh, accuracy with the RTK GPS and we know those position of each one of those plants because we put it there with the seeder and we can then go into it with the mechanical weeder and then go through the field to be able to uh, take out uh, all of the 
uh, areas that are, are not grown by the crop. And so again, if we were to then, rather than put it onto a tractor, put it into uh, a smaller machine using uh, less energy, uh, so much the better. Which brings us on then to another exciting topic as far as I'm concerned, and that's uh, laser weeding. So we came up with the idea about uh, uh, 10 years ago, and um, uh, there has been some quite interesting developments. And the idea again is that we can recognize uh, the weed, and from the machine vision we could recognize the growing point of the weed, and then apply uh, a laser and all that laser is doing is heating it up. Because what we want to do, we don't, we're not playing Star Wars, we don't want to take out uh, the, the Death Star yet, but what we do want to do, this tiny little plant with a tiny little, very delicate area there, the growing point, what we want to do is to raise the cells, the growing point, uh, between 56 and 94 degrees C, um, which is just enough to get the cell membranes to rupture. And uh, that can then be done with a very, very small amount of energy, 5 watts. Tiny amount of energy. Now, here we have <laughs> laser weeding. OK, I like the smoke coming up. OK, there. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Damn you, weed. <laughs> Die. <laughs> <laughs> but um, even with that 5 watt that's not necessary to, to be as, as strong as that because you think this is a tiny little plant here and there's a tiny part of a tiny plant and it's this quest that we're after what is the smallest amount of energy delivered in exact intelligently targeted inputs there it is there you know, the smallest amount of energy to require what we need you see the plants are all still there but that's not going to go anywhere, that's not going to grow, that's stopped it dead, that's finished there now, that's, that's, we've, we've killed the, uh, the, the, the growing point of that plant. I'm not sure how it's going to work with Japanese knotweed or uh, <laughs> any of these other things, but anyway, the concept um, of... Um, and of course then we're saving 100% herbicide with a very small energy source. So again, another really interesting opportunity. Here we've got another uh, mechanical weeding system. This is the autonomous uh, Christmas tree weeder that we developed in Denmark. Christmas trees are an, uh, an agricultural crop, not a forestry crop. These are little Christmas trees being overtaken by weeds. We don't like to use chemicals in here. Herbicides will kill the trees as much as they'll kill the weeds. And what we've got here is a, is a side cutter on a, uh, on a lawn mower where we've taken the seat and the, hand the steering wheel off and put a cutter on the side. And again, we can get two centimetre level accuracy uh, with this uh, little machine. And it can then, uh, these are simulated Christmas trees, and here's the real Christmas trees. Put some guards on the front of it. And it can go down, and we know the position of every Christmas tree. And we can uh, send the cutter out and withdraw the cutter back in to go around the, the tree and then back out again and um, uh, it works and uh, that's the only way to get rid of the woody weeds we get these sort of strong weeds growing up through the canopy the tree canopy and it leaves a hole in it which is then considered a bad quality and so uh, mechanical weeding um, robotic weeding of Christmas trees is a distinct possibility here's some work from uh, Professor Noboro Noguchi um, from uh, Hokkaido um, he's got a, a, a team who's developing a whole range of um, autonomous tractors. Um, I was very lucky to be able to invite him over to England la last month, so he came <laughs> over. Oh yeah, they, they, they walk really fast in Japan, so. <laughs> um, uh, he came over for a few weeks and we collaborated together as we're now building our new generation of robots, and he's got a very big nationally funded uh, project in Japan at the moment to develop a whole range of uh, autonomous machines, autonomous uh, agricultural tractors and machines. And uh, he left me this uh, video which was uh, quite interesting. So this is his uh, third generation of uh, tractors but uh, what he's now starting to do is look at these reliability issues 
and so he lets it run at night. Can you get these things to, are they reli now reliable enough to work at night? So um, the answer is yes. So somebody did stay there with it, they didn't all go home and go to bed uh, and hope that it worked all right because they could have actually had the, the cultivation coming across the road and <laughs> halfway to Tokyo before <laughs> it was picked up. But uh, uh, nevertheless, um, we are now starting to get uh, more reliable systems that will allow us to do significantly long, longer work uh, periods than we've done before. Uh, and again, that brings us on to the, the last part of the talk, which then is uh, selective harvesting. Um, selective harvesting is what we do normally. In fact, when you go to the supermarket and you see three oranges there and you pick that one because that looks the best, you are selective harvesting. But the trouble is that um, <coughs> what we do at the moment is that we often will, particularly with mechanization, we will harvest the whole crop and will throw away a very significant part of that crop because it doesn't meet the right quality criteria. Your supermarkets, when they say, I want a lettuce, they say it needs to be that big, not that big and not that big. It needs to be that big because consumers are asking for this. And so um, we've got issues with expensive, cheap labor. Uh, Many uh, developed countries do use cheap labor. We get a lot of uh, people coming from Eastern Europe and you get a lot of people coming up from uh, Mexico and elsewhere to do this work. But it's difficult to support these large labor forces. You've got to give them houses, you've got to have the buses, you've got to feed them, you've got to look after them, you've got to keep them happy. Can machines help with this? I think that they can. Um, the concept of this whole crop harvesting, uh, up to 60% of this is being thrown away because it's not of the right quality. Can we design a selective harvester that only harvests 100% of saleable quality? So here again is a nice pretty picture of um, my conceptual um, harvester, selective harvester. And what it's doing, it's leaving behind the ones that are not of saleable quality. So maybe this one was too small. But if it's too small, why don't you come back in a week's time, two weeks' time, when it's grown big enough, and be able then to pick it. And you know, because you've just measured it, you know exactly where it is. And then when you know that you've got 24 or 1,000 or whatever it is in that row, it's then worth harvesting it again. It's, not, it's what you or I would do. If you've got gardens at home, and you then go out and say, right, I need an onion for tonight's supper, you pick the best one that you can and you know, oh, that's a smaller one, I'll come back tomorrow, I'll come back next week for that one. That's what we would do. And often when I'm trying to think about solving these problems, I think about how would an individual person do it? Can we then get a machine to do it in the same way? And the back part here is then a, uh, 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 just a trailer. So the idea is that that would be a pallet full of boxes and then when it's filled up, then it would disconnect, go back and another one would then come in and join with it. Okay, so that brings me to the conclusions. I think it is inevitable that uh, uh, agricultural equipment is going to get smarter. We're seeing it all the time. We've got improved automatic control for well-defined tasks. If we look again in successful areas uh, of automation outside of the agricultural sector, any time where we've got semi-skilled jobs being done repetitively, this is where automation will first come in. We can have automated data gathering, better processing into real information. Again, we've had some interesting discussions before the start of the, today's lecture about agriculture has got a problem of big data. We've got the ability to collect huge amounts of data, particularly with all these new systems. But we have to come up with the techniques to crunch them into real information almost in real time. Real time information is the best. Possibility of fully autonomous vehicles with sensible behavior in given context. And I think it's the chance to design and build a complete new small smart mechanization system that will serve humanity in for many generations to come. Uh, somebody asked this morning, uh, are we going to have robotic tractors? And I can put my hand on my heart and say, yes, it's obvious to me. It's absolutely obvious. The next question is when? 
that's a different question. And I think that it is then going to be a case of when the climate is right and the technology has matured and uh, the innovative and entrepreneurial companies pick up this, this, uh, the, uh, these, these concepts. Now, don't think it's going to be the Matthew Ferguson's and the John Deere's that are going to come up with this because this is too disruptive. The big machinery manufacturers have got uh, a very linear view on what they want to do. If you ask them and say, well, what's going to happen in the next few years? Uh, what is your aspiration? Well, I want to move my market share from 35 to 38%. That's about the limit of some of the discussions that I've had with them. This breaks that model completely. And I think that there is an opportunity for entrepreneurial people to be able to start building their own robots that won't necessarily directly compete with the big tractors. There's always going to be a role for big tractors. But um, certainly in these niche areas, the high value niche areas, there, will, there is now an opportunity for uh, these machines. And so um, that's my vision for the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Simon. That was very uh, interesting. Uh, I know we are a little bit over our time, but that's OK. Uh, I'd, I'd welcome you if you do need to go. Uh, go ahead and do that. But we're going to take a few minutes here to uh, ask Simon some questions. If you have those, uh, just slip your hand up. I've got to get it on the mic so the people on the uh, online can hear. Anyone have a question? I'll start here with Mark. Sure. Thank you, Simon. That was a wonderful presentation, very, very inspiring in terms of, of, of forward thinking. And from an academic perspective, I look at this and I think about workforce. So, we're, uh, so you're talking about tremendous changes in, in, in the workforce in agriculture, but it's also an opportunity for training people to new skills and new yes. technologies, and, and, uh, and, and the academic community needs to get ahead of that mm -hmm. in terms of training, training people who can, who can be the technicians in the workforce in the, this arena. So, so um, how do you see that developing in the coming years? Well, I think that... Um what has tended to happen, again, if, I look, if I start my answer by looking in history and then project it forward, is that um, many of the operations, particularly when we've moved to sort of the industrial type of agriculture, has tended to de-skill a lot of things, where you sit on a big tractor and just drive up and down. But with this um, concept, we need smart people to be able to deal with smart machines. And I think that this is actually a real opportunity to be able to uh, uh, increase the opportunities in the rural areas, particularly for high-level employment. Because, um, although I, I don't think you need to be a robotic engineer to service these uh, types of machines, I think that uh, certainly as we develop them, um, and uh, in some cases where we need to look after them, we do need to have these new, new skills. In fact, it's a, a, a particular uh, of interest in, in uh, Japan. As you know, Japan are very interested in, uh, in robotics. And if I remember rightly, the average age of farmers in Japan is now 67. And the government realized that this is an aging population um, in the rural areas. And they wanted to find ways of attracting young people to stay in the rural area. So they actually invested a lot of money in developing some of these concept tractors, these robotic vehicles, because it is a challenge. It, is a, it can be good work. It can be very interesting to be able to develop high technology machines in rural areas. And so I think um, not only do we have to come up with uh, people that can deal with these smarter systems, but I think it will produce uh, much more lucrative rural employment in the future. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the wonderful talk. <coughs> Excuse me. My question is, how do you sort of, now there are self-driving cars, Audi and they have demonstrated self-driving cars. How do you see automated, ro automated um, tractors to be different in terms of navigation uh, from the self-driving cars? I mean, I recognize there are issues in terms well, they, 
to be honest, when, when we're talking about these automatic machines, the problem is always the person, the problem of the people. Uh, what is safety? Uh, can these machines be safe to themselves? Yes. Can they be safe to the crop? Yes. But we have to be, they have to be safe with people. And it's the people that uh, um, is the difficult part. Uh, in most of agriculture, we don't get many people wandering around in the fields. But if you had something like a, a golf course where you're trying to cut grass and there's people around, then you've got a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of potential there. But the, um, the concept of the uh, automated car is what is the purpose of the car? It's to move the person. And so uh, you're always going to have the person inside the car, which makes it somehow a little bit easier. But the tractors are there not to move people around. The tractor's there to carry out a particular task. And so it is those tasks that we are then optimizing with all of these, uh, all of these different machines. But the, 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 the concepts and the approaches between a, a driver, uh, an automatic steered car and an automatic steered tractor, I think obviously are going to be uh, quite similar. But there is a big difference between automatic steering and autonomous. Uh, automatic steering, I can get, I, can, I teach my students how to do automatic steering and within a couple of days they would be able to make an automatic steered car or tractor. Easy. Control loops, PID, GPS, we can do that. Standard. Can we get it to be fully autonomous? No. Fully autonomous. Recognizing what's happening in front. What happens if the engine overheats? What happens if a tree's fallen over? What happens if you get stuck? A wet patch in the field. A thousand and one different things that has to be dealt with if it is truly autonomous. We have to have a lot of intelligence in the machine if we're going to make it autonomous. Automatic steering is easy. Autonomous is a major challenge. So in some cases there are similarities and others uh, not, uh, because uh, with a car the per there will always be a person in the car, so the person can oversee um, all the functions of, of, of what goes on. But in fact it is uh, of interest what we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing lots and lots of um, subsystems being developed on tractors that are driver assist. So different systems for headland turning, different systems for auto steer and so on. So these are all ways in which to help the operator. But again, you've got to be careful because if you automate all of that, they're going to go to sleep very, very quickly and it's going to become dangerous. So you, you must, the, if you're going to, and they're going to have the same problem with cars. You've got to have an interaction from the person with the machine so that the person feels that they are still in control and must respond and do things. Um, so you can't just suddenly take all control away and expect this person just to sit there and, and, and just watch what goes on. They have to interact with it. And that's where we need a lot more sort of psychology and understand what is needed. I thought it was interesting you showed the video from Japan of the tractor doing the work overnight and you come back the next day and the field is tilled and ready to go. I, that reminded me of our center pivot irrigation systems. They're set to go around in a field and to irrigate and you come back the next day or the next morning and, and it's done what it's supposed to do. Th that's the kind of thing that I was kind of intrigued about and how that relates to a machine that's able to do something kind of on its own yet still we're monitoring it. I had the privilege to monitor one of those systems and I couldn't sleep at night knowing that that machine could possibly malfunction and <laughs> flood the entire field. So it never happened, but that was something that I always thought about. So, but I think showing that video really uh, related to kind of our current systems that we're already using. Well, it's, again, it's this level of confidence and the confidence requires uh, time and communication. Uh, if your center pivot uh, had a level of self-awareness and had a, a, an ability to call your smartphone to say, <coughs> uh, this motor's overheating or I'm running out of chemical, 
you would be able to sleep at night uh, and it would then tell you, you would have confidence enough not, not to keep you awake at night. But it requires this same level of interaction like we were talking before to give you that level of confidence. So um, I think that's part of what we have to build into these machines, this uh, uh, level of self-awareness and the communication with the responsible person. Because you've got to think of these things. Um, there's been, for many years we've been discussing the thing of liability and of safety. And often people have got the erroneous idea that because there's no driver on it, that it is in charge of what it does. It is not. It is a tool, like any other tool. And there is a person, there must be a person in charge of that robot, in charge of that robot and in charge of that robot. The same as any other tool. A person's in charge of a car. And if the, if the sat-nav tells you to go up the wrong way up a one-way street, you can't blame the sat-nav. It's, it's a tool. You have to interpret that tool. You might not like it. And so, again, it is this uh, uh, combination of man and machine working together. It's, uh, I'm explaining that in a, in a way because when I first started on robotics, the idea was to get people out of the system. And then, ding, the light bulb went wrong. Meh. I've lost. That's the wrong idea. People are in the system, but they are doing different things. They're not hanging onto a steering wheel. So it is the level, if you want to sleep easy at night, you've got to have the confidence that the machine is doing what you want it to do and that it will tell you when it's doing something outside of the parameters of, what you, of where you don't want it to do. Another question. So I have a question. This question is not said by you guys. What about fuzzy logic? Fuzzy logic, okay. <laughs> right, well, I, we're talking about robots here, and I haven't talked anything about artificial intelligence. Um, there is a huge opportunity for self-learning uh, with these machines. The, the work that I've been um, developing over the last uh, 10 years um, has been uh, something called SAFAR, uh, software architecture for agricultural robots and we don't use any artificial intelligence in that yet. Um, I think what we've got in terms of the deterministic and the reactive behaviours will allow us to deal with, I don't know, 90% of the situations that we deal with but it is a very powerful thing if the machine can learn from its own mistakes or if we have the ability to be able to say bad robot don't do that again and that's where the fuzzy logic and the self-learning uh, and the genetic algorithms might then cut in to allow us then to do things in different ways but um, at the moment yes certainly for an intel a real intelligent machine we've got to have self-learning capacity but if I take you back to what I said at the outset, is that we don't want this thing to play a piano and paint a Picasso picture. We want it to dig weeds out the ground. And we understand that context well enough. And so within a given context, uh, we should be able to identify the appropriate behaviours so that uh, we don't need so much uh, self-learning at the moment. I'm going to ask one more or just finish with one more thought, if you will. Um, you talked about uh, minimum energy. And in Nebraska and in many parts of this country, we use minimum or no tillage in our systems. Are we ever going to get to a point where we are going to be at no energy in our crop production systems? Way out in the future. Is, is that even something to, to, to think about at all? Well, you, you talked earlier about looking over the horizon, looking into the, into the deep future. Um, I can't think of any situation where we would actually interact or modify the natural environment that would then require no energy. But if we were to be able to get to the point of 
understanding the minimum change that we need and then being able to get that energy from renewable sources in terms of where we were talking uh, earlier about the slug example the slug example or the um, uh, energetic autonomy some type of closed loop system um, then yes um, but that still is going to have energy and that energy may well come from its local environment but uh, I think it would have to be a pretty clever system to have no energy in it whatsoever. But it, I think that, um, as I say, the more I look at these systems, the more I'm amazed that we do things in pretty dumb ways at the moment. We throw fertilizer all over the place and chemicals all... Certainly, think about that laser weeding, how much tiny, tiny, tiny amount of energy that was needed for each of those weeds and think how much energy we have to use at the moment, or we do use at the moment. So uh, I can see a, a minimum amount of energy, or we're starting to understand the minimum amount of energy that's needed with the current thinking. But you might be thinking on a, on a different plane than I am at the moment. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, again, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Dr. Blackmore for uh, giving this uh, great presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.